Hello everybody, my name is John Smith and for the next 45 or 50 minutes I'm going to talk to you about a railway line, railway station um, outside Virginia town. It was a working station for about 100 years and in this uh, brief talk, brief enough, I'm going to give you an overview of Virginia Road's history. So to, uh, to the outline of the talk, I'm first of all going to talk about the location of the railway line, the background to Virginia Road, when the line was built and why. Why the station was called Virginia Road, I'm going to take a look at passenger and goods services. And usually for a period of 10 years, there's quite a lot of attacks on this, on railway staff and on railway property. I'm going to talk about that as well. And then I'm going to take a look at the final years of Virginia Road Railway and look at what's left today. This is an ordinary survey map of the line. If you look at the black line running through the screen, the center of the screen, the railway line ran from Kells, by and large following the contours of the Blackwater River. And at Virginia Road then, it veered inland and followed the contours of the Mead Calvin border. Uh, an aerial um, <clears throat> photograph of the line there, you see those yellow dots. That's basically uh, the railway line. And you see it from Virginia Road to Old Castle. It crossed into Cavan for about two miles and re entered Mead in the town land, at the town on the Bullies. The line from Virginia Road to Old Castle ran through three civil parishes, Kilskir, uh, Mutraconic, and Old Castle, and crossed about 13 town lands. So, a quite a large catchment area. The process of building the railway line. First of all, a company of interested parties, investors from a railway company. They then solicited shareholders to invest in the proposed line or route. A route was surveyed, mapped, and a prospectus of this was released for public viewing. Permission was sought from uh, the British Parliament to construct the line, a parliamentary committee, Westminster. When the license or permission was granted, a contract was appointed to build the line. When the line was completed, the Board of Trade inspected the railway line and authorised it for public traffic. And then the line was officially opened as a permanent way. It advertised timetables for passengers and goods trade commenced. Now, by the time Virginia Road was built in 1863, the Dublin and Drogheda railway line was a well-established railway company but it still had to follow, uh, by and large, this procedure uh, for building the railway line. And um, Tom Ferris, who's written quite a, a lot of material on um, the Irish railway network, Irish rail history, he says that Ireland's rail network had a slow and stuttering start. Before the famine, the 1830s, a royal inquiry suggested linking Dublin and Cork, Dublin and Galway, i.e. two trunk lines, two railway lines. The Irish economy, it felt at this time, would not support an extensive countrywide rail network. However, there was some rail building before the famine by a plethora of railway companies, often linking just one town to another. The famine, 1845 to 50, stalled railway expansion. So there was some rail, uh, railway lines built, but not that many um, before the famine. However, by the 1860s, the time that we're talking about here at Virginia Road, Tom Ferris suggests second phase of railway construction occurred in, was occurring in Ireland, indicating that Ireland was recovering from the famine. The Dublin and Drogheda Railway Company gradually extended its network. It built lines from Dublin to Drogheda in 1838, extended it to Navan in 1850, to Kells in 1853, and um, to Virginia Road, Old Castle in 1863. This indicates that investors were more confident that Ireland was recovering from the famine, especially in cattle livestock trade. Now, why extend the railway line beyond Kells? Johnson says that the Dublin and Drogheda Railway Company had no real incentive to go beyond Kells. There's no incentive to go inland at this point. We're talking about the 1850s. In December 1859, the chairman stated that there was an unwillingness to spend shareholders' money on further rail extensions. However, with another phase of railway construction underway, 
Johnson says, to offset another railway company incorporating the Mead Cavan border region, the Dublin and Drogheda extended the line towards Old Castle. The chairman stayed in 1853. Injurious competition was due to rise if competing rail companies operate in the same district. So in other words, one of the incentives to build a railway line from Cowles to Virginia Road to Old Castle was to incorporate that region into the D and D network before another railway company did so. Tom Ferris says, turf wars were a feature of this phase of railway construction. So railway companies were being, uh, and lines were being planned, railway companies were planning lines all over the country at this point. The Dublin and Mead Railway Company, another railway company, proposed building a rail line from Kells to Bailiborough, crossing much the same territory as the D&D line, but rather than venturing inland, it veered towards Bailiborough, allowing for a connection to the Northern Network. So there was a planned route from Kells to Bailiborough, taking in quite a, a, a good slice, a good chunk, of the Mead Cavan border region, but rather than heading towards Old Castle, it veered towards Bailiborough. And of course, the D&D were aware of this. Both companies released their prospectus, the outline of their rail routes, simultaneously. Uh, this was published in, um, I think it was the Mead Herald. In 1859, the Dublin Odrahada Railway Company got permission to build the railway lines from railway line from Kells to Virginia Road to Old Castle. And the Cal's Daily Borough line never uh, materialised and was mentioned again. The D&D uh, Railway Company was a very experienced company at this stage and it knew the process of getting permission to build the railway line very well at this point. So permission was granted to construct the 13 mile extension from Cal's to Old Castle in June 1860 by the Parliamentary Committee. Virginia Road was an intermediate station between Kells and Old Castle, situated about 6.5 miles from Kells, about halfway between the two towns. A budget of £80,000 was earmarked, set aside for the project by the company, um, and the completion date of September 1862 was set. Engineer Martin Burke was contracted to construct the project, to construct the railway line, given uh, £28,000 for the work. Virginia Road was reached by July, August, 1861. We know this because the uh, death of a railway navvy, uh, James Farley at Clonsilla was quite close to Virginia Road. They hit the 12th of August, 1861. In other words, it, the line had been extended beyond Virginia Road for about a mile into the town of Clonsilla. And the death of this navvy um, indicates that the line was progressing pretty well at this point. The line was incomplete by September 1862, and this frustrated the sh uh, shareholders who wanted to know why. The chairman of the D&D said uh, that the foreman of the works had not pushed things as much as he ought to have. In other words, um, the foreman wasn't really getting the work done. This is what um, the chairman told the shareholders at this particular meeting. However, the railway line from Cowles to Old Castle was officially opened on the 17th of March, 1863. Newspapers were advertising timetables for the railway extension from the 18th of March onwards, 18th of March, 1863 onwards. This is a very, very poor screenshot of the Freeman's Journal, but it clearly indicates here, this is for the 18th of March, 1863, um, and it is uh, officially advertising um, public traffic for public traffic on the line from uh, from Dublin for Kells, Virginia Road Station and on Castle uh, services to and from these stations. Constructing a, a railway line was um, very labour intensive. The Dublin and Drogheda chairman said that the work of the line will be extremely light. The terrain was most favourable for constructing a railway. The DD chairman didn't expect that the, the work would be very heavy or very difficult. Hundreds of men needed to cut and bank, lay down sleepers, hammer available lines into place. It employed an awful lot of people, the railway works from Kells to Virginia Road to Old Castle. If you think of the amount of horses, mules, donkeys, uh, donkeys 
were needed to ferry ballast stones to and from the works. It must have been a very, very busy, uh, busy site indeed. A lot of work was provided for skilled and for semi-skilled labourers for about 30 months. The engineers had access to a train engine to help them with ballasting. 13 overbridges were built and two accommodation underpasses for farmers. James Lennox Napper sold the land to the railway company. He received £2,600 for this from Virginia Road to Old Castle. Why the delay? There was about, about a six or seven month delay, probably because um, the construction work was underestimated. At least that's my view. And I'm, I'm not sure why, but I'm, I'm speculating there. As well as the overbridges um, and underpasses, you had probably dozens of accommodation level crossings like this. M most don't survive anymore. There are a few along, along the uh, line, the old line, but this was for farmers who wanted to transport livestock from one part of his field to another. Um, you have to remember that the railway line basically ran to slice through fields and cut them in half. And the company did provide these um, level crossings for farmers. Uh, the name of the station is quite unusual with Virginia Road because Virginia Town is six miles from the station. The station itself, Virginia Road, was situated on a crossroad in the townland of Potter Ray, just inside the main border. The road for the railway station runs. It runs through Eaton Burt, the town on the Eaton Burt. The railway company gave the station the name Virginia Road. Large goods, sheds, waiting rooms, clerical offices indicate that the railway line intended to incorporate a large catchment area. Mullet, Whitegate, Carner Ross and adjacent townlands had a road link to the station. With no railway link directly to Virginia Town, it seems clear that the station served, that this station, Virginia Road, served the passenger needs and transport of goods for the town. In other words, I think that Virginia Road um, was to be Virginia's town station. And it doesn't seem that there was ever an incentive to extend directly to Virginia town. I don't think there was a financial incentive to do so. Virginia Road was Virginia town's railway station in short. This is where the station is situated. Uh, today, it's Sheridan's, Sheridan's Cheesemongers. You'll see that the railway line is located just off a crossroad uh, with the right, with this road here uh, linking directly uh, to a road, the main road to Virginia. Um, okay. I don't really know where else they could have situated um, Virginia Road Railway if they wanted access to Virginia Town and to Muller. Um, that uh, that particular road here uh, is a it's about a mile in length and it connects directly to the main um, Virginia Dublin Road. Just an example of a um, overbridge, double arched overbridge on the line that uh, ran straight there towards Old Castle. This is situated um, at Virginia Road. Now, I won't dwell too much on the, the description of um, the railway station and Goodshed, simply to say that at the best of stone and dressing and uh, craftsmanship and stone masonry went into both these buildings, that is to say, the old station there and the Goodshed. This, is, uh, this information is coming from an architectural website. And just to read that uh, particular note in green, it says, the sneak stone walls of this former warehouse were clearly executed by skilled masons. In other words, this was a, these were very fine buildings with the finest of stone work and um, built by, uh, by very skilled stone masons, skilled craftsmen. So the railway line was opened for business, as we said earlier, in uh, 1863, March 1863. So Morning services to Dublin from Old Castle towards Dublin ran between 8 o'clock and 8.30 a.m. And return services from Dublin through Virginia Road around 6 in the evening. There's also Sunday specials. These were quite popular. Trains to football matches, the truck park pilgrimages, Dublin horse show, race meetings, excursions uh, to and from Dublin. 
and special occasions. So there were there were all sorts of reasons why people travelled, particularly for these Sunday specials. There's an advertisement there on the the screen from 1864, I think it is. Cheap train with Sunday June first, and you can see here there's first, second, and third class fares. Uh, this is, I think it's from the Freeman's Journal. Um, this is uh, an advertisement of a Sunday special, encouraging people to come from Dublin towards Kells, Virginia Road and Old Castle for a day excursion. And you'll just see here at the bottom, it says, and I'll read it, return tickets to Navan, Kells, Virginia Road or Old Castle, first class, second class, third class, could use the fares. The Marquis of Hedford has liberally cons uh, consented to throw open Hedford Domain on these occasions, to the excursionists, all at Cal, a light at Cal Station, and this is from 1864. So, from a very early, from the very early stage, these Sunday excursions were taking place and were being run. Why did people uh, travel uh, from Virginia Road uh, to Dublin or to Kells or to Navan? Shopping, visiting relatives, attending hospitals salesmen coming and going, emigration, day out to the beach. Uh, the Mead Hunt actually used Virginia Road as a rend uh, rendezvous point in the 1890s, early 1900s. 1914 to 1918, the War Office was using the rail network um, to move uh, internees to the Old Castle POW camp through Virginia Road. Goods. Goods trains arrived uh, from Dublin in the morning around 11, 11.15 and returned from Old Castle about 3.30. These are approximate times. They changed not that much over the 100 years. I was um, uh, um, brought in and brought out tea, sugar, alcohol, tobacco, meat, milk, fertilizers, farm tools, agriculture, machinery. In other words, bulky goods. It could be uh, brought on the goods train taken off by a crane, you see the crane here, and stored in a goods shed. There was livestock specialists from Old Castle, this passed through Virginia Road. Goods shed stored boxes, caskets of goods, and these were collected by business owners or later on delivered directly by GNR lorries. A crane loaded these goods onto the cart, and as I said later, GNR lorries delivered bulky goods from the station to business sites. Virginia Road had direct access to Dublin Port um, uh, and to Great Britain, so imported exported goods could be facilitated within the day. As well as delivering um, goods to and from Virginia Road and providing um, passenger services, Virginia Road was a type of reference point um, for things that were happening in the, in the district, the, the region, the location. For example, um, very often when crimes were reported in the local newspapers, Virginia Road was referenced. Auctioneers selling property within the region of Virginia Road mentioned the railway station in the advertisement. The local railway line enabled people outside the district to have a geographical reference point for matters being reported in the district. Two examples. For example, here, this is a farm that was being sold in Rye Field in 1872. It says there, um, attractive uh, sale at Rye Field, four miles from Virginia Road, four miles from Old Castle. So uh, this Mr. Um, Henry Gray was emigrating on his 35 acre farm along with a substantial dwelling. Loud offices were being advertised for sale. But it's interesting that uh, very often these advertisements uh, mention Virginia Road. Again, uh, this crime took place, another um, reason, another way in which Virginia Road was being referenced was in the reporting of crimes. This took place in, as I said, 1931, and it says here, a particularly mean form of housebreaking took place at Virginia, at Rahard, about two miles from Virginia Road Railway. And there's uh, loads of examples of these in the local newspapers. For a rural um, railway line, there was quite a lot of attacks on railway staff 
for a period of about 10 years, from about 1905 to 1914, 1915. And I'm not quite sure why, um, but I'll give you some examples. <clears throat> to put it in context, Virginia Road uh, Railway was a very rural and isolated station. The nearest RI, RIC station was Connor Ross, four miles away. Uh, Virginia Barracks, six miles. As I said, for a period from 1905 to 1911, an incidents of civil disorder occurred at the station. Uh, just a few examples. In November 1905, three men were summoned before a prosecuted petty sessions for assaulting station master Thomas McCallum. They were also intoxicated and trespassing. Each were fined five, five shillings and another five shillings for cost. Another attack on Mr. McCallum occurred on, in December 1906 by two men from Virginia. They were fined two and six for obstructing the station staff in the discourse of their duties. One man was sent to prison for a month. Mr. McCallum was embroiled in a libel case with Terence Boylan, blacksmith at Virginia Road Station. Um, the blacksmith's workshop was actually just beside, right at, beside, uh, adjacent to Virginia Road Station. And really, these two men should really have got on with each other. Uh, because they worked beside and close to each other. And for some reason or another, there was uh, trouble between these two men. I think they settled out of court, but um, again, just more tensions um, happening between Mr. McCallan and, um, you know, uh, local businesses, in this case, the blacksmith. Another attack on a station master, another uh, a station master that had um, uh, replaced Mr. McCallan, Mr. Coulihan, um, that happened in December 1909. Um, Mr. O'Reilly was refused a ticket to travel from Virginia Road to Kells. He entered the station house, pulled the master, station master out, and was about to get and was about to give him a bad beating. The porter managed to pull him away, O'Reilly given a month in prison. Now we don't know why these attacks were taking place, simply that they were. A few weeks later, another railway case, Hugh Smith from Kells appeared across the Kale Petty Sessions for obstructing railway staff and using abusive language towards him. Royal Magistrate added, it's the only station that I find coming before me so often. It seems that um, even the uh, the judges were getting frustrated with the amount of cases that were coming before uh, the Petty Sessions Court relating to attacks on staff at Virginia Road. In 1911, a row of Union Jacks, uh, a row of Union Jack flags flying at Virginia Road station were cut down by a band of local men flying the flags to honour the Royal Visit of George V um, at Virginia Road was the only station to have such bunting displayed on the network and as a result local feeling ran rather high on the matter. These flags were cut cut down by local people um, who didn't want them flying at the station but interestingly um, Virginia Road was the only station in the entire network that had this bunting, these flags flying. Um, in February 1914, a farmer from Balgree fined for verbally abusing railway staff not showing his ticket when requested. The report of this case opened this account by stating, Virginia Road Station, which has become a storm centre of late, late years, was again mentioned in the case across the Keeley Petty Sessions. In other words, all of these attacks um, were uh, you know, they were, they were causing some frustration for the court system and also noted by uh, the newspapers who were reporting all of these attacks. It was unusual that, you know, a railway station would become the centre of attacks because a railway line was a very important, you know, social amenity. Why there were tensions, why there was animosities, I can't say. All I can say is that there were a lot of examples of this happening over this 10-year period. There was also destruction uh, uh, on um, Virginia Road property. A report from January 1909 states that a particular man um, entered the station and completely ruined the signal cabin, smashed it to pieces, it says. The report calls it an unprecedented, in the, on, the attack was unprecedented in the history of the Great Northern Railway. A man from Ballydoro nearby, near the railway station, tore a weighing machine from its cement foundations and placed all the nose boards on the track. He then secured a fish plate and broke the door of the signal cabin. 
Once inside the signal cabin, he laid waste to everything that came his way. Telephones, electric bells, lamps, desks, 37 panes of glass, toolboxes and rail, car, uh, rail charts were scattered in all directions. The point levers in the cabin were tampered with. 100 pounds of the, uh, 100 pounds worth of damage was done. Um, Mr. McCallan arrived on the scene with a loaded gun and along with other employees ordered Mr. McEnroe off the premises. Um, it seems the railway staff were alerted to the attack and came down line to, to deal with it. Um, interestingly, Mr. McCallan there was a loaded gun. The intruder made a dash for a boy in one of the railway staff um, and a blow with the gun did not stop him from pursuing Boylan. The gun was broken clean at the hammer. Um, so what the railway uh, station master did was he uh, gave a blow uh, with his gun um, at the intruder, um, but uh, didn't stop him. In fact, the gun. Mr. McEnroe, the intruder, Trotling Boylan on the track, other railway employees arrived and managed to apprehend him. Well, there was four or five railway staff at this place and they, they managed to, to sort of um, reach him and pin him down. They bound his hands and brought him to the waiting rooms where he calmed down and began to talk to staff. This is the intruder, Mr. McEnroe. RIC patrols arrived at the scene and McEnroe was brought to Virginia Barracks, later transferred to Monaghan Asylum, certified insane. The entire episode, the attack on the railway property, began at five in the morning and it must have lasted some hours from beginning to end. Train services were disrupted for some hours due to the damage uh, to the rail points. So this was quite, um, it was quite an attack, did quite a lot of damage and um, must have been a very, very eventful morning uh, in the history of the railway line. Again, why Mr. McEnroe uh, caused this damage uh, why the railway line was attacked, I just, I can't say. There was no motive given for the attack, but uh, a lot of damage was done. There was another attack on the signal cabin that was set fire in January 1923. And later that year, two men robbed uh, eight pounds from the station ticket office. Um, I tend to think that earlier attack in 1923 may have um, may have occurred during the uh, the Irish Civil War. Uh, and then later on, um, an attack, um, later on, a robbery uh, later that year. Just again, more examples of attacks on um, railway staff and on the railway line. Another robbery took place at Virginia Road Goods Shed in January 1937. The intruder spent an hour in the shed opening boxes of tobacco, whiskey and other products. So um, all told, there was you know, quite a lot of um, activity in terms of attacking staff and attacking railroad property, um, especially in uh, the 20th century, early years, of the, the early decades of the 20th century. I'm going now to take a look at the final years of Virginia Road Railway. In 1924, after partition, the Irish Free State amalgamated all stations south of the border and called it the Great Southern Railway. So the Free State, if you like, took ownership of all of the railway lines. However, the GNR operated as an independent company because it operated in both jurisdictions, both north and south. Um, so uh, for a period of 20 or 30 years after partition, it was allowed to operate um, on its own. Goods and passenger services continued at Virginia Road as usual. A rail bus, a bus adopted to run on the railway line, was introduced in the in 1940s to augment services. In the 1920s, Great Northern Railway buses ran services from Kilmalek, Ballad James Duff, and Virginia Town to Virginia Road Station, and this allowed them to travel to Dublin directly. By the end of the 1950s, the Great Northern Railway Ireland was running out of money, was effectively bankrupt. I think it was four. Four million in the red, if I remember rightly. Both governments established the Great Northern Railway Ireland Board and funded the company. That is to say, from the early 1950s, governments in the north and in the south funded the Great Northern Railway, allowed it to function, was subsidised. However, a long term, 
this level of investment was unsustainable. In 1956, the Northern Ireland government decided to close most of the railway stations north of the border. The Southern government had no option but to close former Great Northern Railway lines. Um, I think the Irish government was more willing, the Irish government itself was more willing to um, subsidise the Great Northern Railway, but the uh, the Transport Authority in Northern Ireland less so. And when it when it really closed the railway lines north of the border, um, the viability of the Great Northern Railway was just basically was wasn't um, wasn't an option. Rail bus services ceased at Virginia Road in 1956. There is uh, an advertisement from the Irish Independent 1905 to Dublin from Kinlanlet, Bala James Duff, and Virginia to Virginia Road. Train departs at 1831. So you could get uh, buses from nearby towns to Virginia Road and then on to Dublin. And there were also uh, return services there from Dublin, um, morning and evening uh, services. There is somebody, uh, this is to the um, right of the screen, you have the rail bus there, GNR, you'll clearly see on it. Um, that's in the uh, a museum of Belfast, I think. But that bus was adapted to um, to run on the line. Um, and uh, it ran, I think, afternoon services mainly, from Virginia Road to Kells to Old Castle and so on. In June 1858, the CIE, the state body run of the Irish Railway system, closed all lines running from Drogheda to Old Castle, and this, of course, included Virginia Road. So passenger services ceased at Virginia Road in 1958. It was no longer uh, no longer a station. Um, the goods services were transferred to Old Castle. I don't think there was any goods services at Virginia Road from 1958 also. There is continued to transfer goods to and from Old Castle to Virginia Road. Yeah, so the goods were de uh, were deposited at the goods shed in Old Castle and brought by Lurie uh, to Virginia Road. So really, the point being there is that Virginia Road uh, ceased offering passenger and goods services. You could get goods delivered uh, to Old Castle and then transported to Virginia Road by Lurie. In 1858, from 1858 to 1863, goods passed through Virginia Road Station, which probably had a few staff members manning the signal boxes, repairing lines, etc. Uh, Virginia Road was basically um, a through station from, 18, from 1958 to 18, to 1963. Uh, it didn't operate any services, but it, it would have been a running line coming from Old Castle uh, to Kells. In April 1863, all goods services ceased at Old Castle. And therefore, Virginia Road and Old Castle Station were closed permanently. Um, at some point after its closure, Virginia Road premise was used by Mr. Andy Gibney. For some decades after uh, the station's closure, he ran an agricultural business from the old station. And then in the early 2000s, Sheridan Cheesemongers bought the station house and restored the buildings. Um, and that is the situation today. Why did Virginia Road close? The Irish government was not willing to subsidise the Irish rail system. Many rail lines closed throughout Ireland in the 1940s to 1960s. What was happening at Virginia Road was a countrywide trend. By the way, the, um, the picture there to the right is Virginia Road Station in 2020. Um, CIE bus services were often an alternative mode of transport. Um, this was also uh, the case is that buses and lorries and cars were um, more becoming more popular forms of transport, and this was taking passengers from the rail network. Road system was improving, cars, lorries becoming more popular. Um, the public have no one else to blame. They're not using the rail services. This was quoted by um, a main county councillor when they were discussing the closure of the lines. He basically said that nobody was using the lines. Twice daily services from Navan to Castle, and not one of them, no one, I'm sorry, no one on them, no one on the trains, in other words. So it seems there was empty trains coming from Old Castle through Virginia Road and down through the network. The line was a white elephant, according to another county councillor. 
losing money every day. In 1864, sorry, 1964, rail sleepers were taken up. Um, over 3,000 were sold at Virginia Road. The railway line, the old track, was sold to farmers whose land was adjacent to the old track. So if you had a farm close to the railway line, you could buy it back and incorporate the old track back into your, your farmland again. In some places, the rail bed was left intact and used for farm traffic. Uh, you'll see the old line, what's left of it, you'll see in places the, uh, the track, um, uh, sorry, in other places, the old rail track was leveled and merged into the fields it once ran through. So um, in locations, on locations, um, the railway track was just basically leveled back, merging with, with the land it once passed. On other occasions, it would be the track bed was left intact and used for farm traffic. Most of the railway bridges are still used by modern by modern day traffic. In recent years, the CIA engineers have replaced at least two of them one at uh, Lisnagan and another rail bridge at, um, at Old Castle, Cooney's Bridge. The best way to view the line as it exists today is from the air. Nearly 60 years after the line's closure, uh, it has still left an imprint on the landscape. Just some pictures there of the line uh, from the early 2000s. That's the back of the uh, railway station. This is an aerial photograph of um, the line today. You clearly see here, this is a, a Bully's ra a railway bridge. This is the old line where my cursor is. At this point, it crosses into Cavan. This is the Mead Cavan border here. and continues into the town of Nakanave, another rail bridge. You can see here even the imprint on the land, even though this particular farmer here had leveled the old track bed back into his fields. And it's taken up again here. That's another aerial uh, aerial photograph of the old line of what, what remains of it. Here you can see it's running into Calvin and veering down here towards Junior Road. Uh, an interesting feature that's left on uh, that's left on the uh, bridge at uh, the old station. This is a Royal, a Royal Mail cast iron mailbox, still in place, fixed into a railway bridge at the station. It dates from 1905, the reign of Edward VII. Uh, as with many Royal, uh, Royal Mail, but all Royal Mail boxes, its original red colour was painted green after 1923. Um, just a, a nice little feature that has, has remained. Just, uh, what remains of the old uh, track bed there. And then um, this, by the way, is a rail underbridge um, at Clonacilla. Uh, the railway line ran actually over uh, above this, uh, on top of this rail bridge towards Old Castle. Just to mention some sources um, on this uh, particular line, there's a brief essay in the Munch Connacht History, 1847 to 1997. There's another article in the history uh, of the parish you can skier on Ballon Law. And then um, I have published um, a brief article uh, on the Virginia Road Railway in um, last year's um, edition of the Breffany Journal. Um, and that is, uh, that is it, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me. And I hope you got something from the talk. And um, we will we will meet again at some point. All the best. Thank you. Bye.